And for me, that we have named this series for Redline, it is so important because what it connotes to me more than anything is that where we are today isn't just serendipitous. It isn't by chance. It was the result of very deliberate decisions that were made by many people in positions of power, politically elect, particularly elected officials, that led inexorably to the circumstances that we find ourselves in in Baltimore City today. A key, key factor in that was the redlining exercise that the federal government did in the 1930s. What happened was that in each city, a map was created which divided neighborhoods to areas which should have financing and neighborhoods that should not. If you were able to go to the non-redlined areas, you were able to get conventional mortgage loans. You were uh, able to get uh, home improvement loans. If you were in a redlined area, you had to go to speculators for financing. You could never know the history, the pain, the trust that has been broken relative to our history in this country. That said, that's fundamental uh, to where we are. Now, I have a, I have a friend who is uh, white, uh, Republican, very prominent, very prominent. And uh, he and I have very honest, candid conversations. And I made the case to him that you all need to acknowledge <laughs> what has transpired, what you contributed to, right, relative to the the broken trust, the pain and suffering that African Americans have gone through in this country. And he, he, he acknowledged those issues, right? He said, man, we can't say that, right? Because it just will upset a bunch of people, right? And I'm like, you can't move forward in a relationship until you acknowledge, if you've done wrong to somebody, you have to acknowledge that you've done wrong. Redlining. Redlining still exists right now, right? If you live in 21216 versus living somewhere in the county, what you pay for insurance premiums, auto insurance premium, is a form of redlining, right? The people who need the most benefit, cost benefit from auto insurance, pay the most. So much of what we are now trying to grapple with is information that was hidden from us. Right? It didn't exist in the history books in our schools. It, can't, it just can't happen overnight. So we have to have sustained commitment to righting the wrongs, creating opportunities, make sure the disparities that we know exist in Sandtown and other communities, right? We gotta make sure that they get flipped around, right? And we can't take a step back, right? So one of the things that we have to commit to as a community, as one Baltimore, is that we're gonna work on this together, that we're gonna have authentic conversations, that we won't shy away from the painful truth, Right? We won't dwell on it beyond what's necessary just to have basic fundamental, fundamental information because you can't correct something that's wrong unless you acknowledge that something is broken. So I'm hoping that the conversations that we have tonight, the ones that happen in the rest of the series, other conversations that are happening around the community, that Baltimore stands up and is recognized as a leader for moving through this stuff, and that we don't have a situation like we have in other communities, right, where our political leaders are scrambling to keep their jobs, right? God darn the politicians. Let's make sure that as a community, we drive the change that's necessary for us to be a better Baltimore. Thank you. You miss everybody who's not out on the street if you're focusing only on the most aggravating and threatening aspects of inner city life. You don't see most of the Baltimore youth who are in their homes doing homework, at school, at work, engaged in hobbies, uh, art, and sports. The last 30 years of research has, has converged on one compelling and clear fact, that it's not just the family you're born into that determines your fate, but the neighborhood you grow up in. Neighborhoods matter. We need to be able to develop more affordable housing in safe, opportunity-rich neighborhoods. Um, we, we need to be able to either create those neighborhoods in place or give families a chance to enter them. And we cannot create or maintain federally subsidized ghettos of concentrated poverty. I think uh, our young folks, they just need exposure uh, to people's success stories, and they need to see that success is possible, uh, preferably from people that come from where they come from, 
and, and look, the, you know, look like they look. Before we have this future-focused conversation, we have to acknowledge and own the history, right? The oppression of black people in this country is strategic and intentional. And we have an amnesiac society. Baltimore, as some of you may know, is ground zero for American apartheid. Uh, in 1910, on December 20th, Baltimore passed the first racial zoning law in the United States uh, to comprehensively zone the city by race. Howard Jackson, he actually formed a committee for segregation. So he was like, hey, let's get together, guys. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna, I need you to be on the committee. Need you to be on the committee? We're going to have a committee to enforce segregation in this city. And then in 1937, Mayor Howard Jackson, in his second go around as mayor, um, segregated public housing. And these are the godfathers, if you will, of, of segregation, of Baltimore's apartheid. Here's Baltimore today. We are a hyper-segregated city. As Douglas Massey says, uh, we're actually in the top eight hypersegregated cities in the entire United States, along with other cities like Flint, Detroit, Chicago, Birmingham, uh, St. Louis, other cities that are also undergoing crises. And of course, we've had our own here. And Chess is an example of the disparities that exist because redlining actually helps structure advantage for white, the white L, and it helps structure disadvantage for the black butterfly one way in which that plays out is the free charm city circulator, which operates exclusively in the White L, where people have the means to pay for busing, yet in those communities where people are strapped for cash, they are part of a system, a bus system where they have to pay. So we have a unique opportunity that's on the horizon, and one of the things that they're dealing with with zoning is the density of liquor stores in the city. So I'll just tell you, Baltimore is about twice the number of alcohol outlets per population than what would be deemed um, acceptable by um, standards based on the CDC and the uh, National Institute of Health. The number has actually gotten bigger over time because as people have left the city, the number of liquor stores hasn't decreased in proportion to the people that are leaving the city. The reason that I think this is relevant is because, again, the liquor stores don't completely cover um, they don't completely cover the, the red areas, but you'll notice they're very heavily concentrated in those areas. And then you get some speckled in some of the areas that are blue and green. But if you notice in the areas that are blue and green, they're mostly on main veins, so that the people in that L that Lawrence talked about have access, but don't have to have it in their backyard. So there's even been a system that correlates with this around what types of businesses we allow to go in communities and then the impact that they have on those communities. We did a health impact assessment and figured out that if we could reduce alcohol outlet density in Baltimore City by 20%, it would be the single greatest thing that we could do to reduce violence in the city. We could avert an estimated 990 counts of violence if we could reduce alcohol outlet density in the city by 20%. And when you look at this, the communities that most need that the communities that would be most impacted are predictably the communities that are least likely to get it because they have been on the short end of the chronic enduring in, in impacts of structural racism in the city. The gap in life expectancy here in Baltimore City uh, is 20 years, so between those that live the longest and those that um, live the shortest lives. And it's usually, it's within a four mile radius, right? Baltimore's not very big. And actually the lowest average life expectancy in certain neighborhoods in Baltimore is lower than the average life expectancy in Rwanda or Nepal. So what I'll say to conclude is that, you know, I think for us at the health department, 
there are tangible ways that we can start to address the issue of health disparities. Does it mean that a lot of these persistent policy challenges and systemic barriers are going to way, go away overnight? No, but I do think that it allows us to say that there is hope, right? A lot of what we talked about here can seem very intractable and very difficult um, to actually address, and I think that there is hope for tangible solutions and the tangible results that come from that. So. Uh, and, I, and I'm really here just to really understand how the arts can be leveraged in revitalization of Baltimore, how the arts can be used to give a voice to the youth of our community so that they have a means to create and sculpt their future. You know, and so much so that the city spends roughly $3 per resident on, retro, on reactively cleaning up graffiti and $0 in investing in spaces that facilitate this artwork. Um, and, and, and celebrate this artwork as a cultural asset to our creative landscape, which, is, which I think is a problem. The impact of redlining is that people have been trapped. People have been robbed of their human capital and their human potential. People are now born into this legacy. People are born into concentrated poverty. People are born into a system that is this, by design does not work for them. So because we're here, and because our uh, uh, awesome 21st century, city, 21st century Cities Initiative was bold enough to take this on, I think some of the questions that we need to ponder are, what then becomes the role of the institutions to help undo these institutional and structural problems? Dr. Farholin, you mentioned zoning which I think has been for so long separated from public health, uh, which at one time, as you mentioned, they were intertwined. How can we bring those two fields back together so that we can zone our way back to healthy, thriving communities? And for all of our panelists, I'm wondering, do you think that Baltimore can zone its way back to a healthy, thriving city? So the phenomenon is guns without teeth. We have had good zoning on the books since the 70s that has had no enforcement behind it. So our laws are only as good as the enforcement that goes along with them. So the real interesting question becomes, how do we get enforcement for the laws that we have? How do we get enforcement for the laws that we have that would have people who were participating in redlining actually be committing a criminal act? If we just honored the laws we had on the books, we could probably undo much of this. So I like to bring up another example. It's not exactly zoning, but we're discussing now a $535 million mega TIF for Port Covington, right? Uh, Kevin Plank Sagamore Development Corporation. Uh, at the bottom of the white L that you saw earlier, it would sort of tie the, the vertical and the horizontal together. Um, now, so we're talking about building a new mini city while in East and West Baltimore in the Black Butterfly, Vacant homes are falling over and killing people. So where are public housing communities disproportionately concentrated, exclusively concentrated? And so that's what we have to think about with zoning. Can we zone for public housing in white, in the white L? So there are residual impacts that come from the original redlining that in, indeed keep individuals in our city as isolated and marginalized as those original policies. I am one of many who have had very long commutes. Uh, as you can see, I've had to tell you, you had to take this bus, you had to take this train, you had to take this here. And so if you talk to a lot of Baltimoreans, this is the exact uh, map of what people have to do all the time to get to work, to get to school, etc. And they know there's going to be a long way that they have to go. And as I took that commute, I couldn't help but to see the transitions of the neighborhood. I was coming from downtown. I was going past all the prisons that was on Greenmount before it turns to York Road. And then eventually getting out of the city and then moving into the burbs of, uh, of, of Towson, if you will. So I saw that uh, for a long time in my life. And we actually know that a renaissance of wealth in the African American community in Baltimore in terms of home ownership business, jobs, middle skill jobs that would result in a $3.3 billion revenue increase in the city. Okay? So let's be clear. But that means that, that we would have to invest in African Americans to achieve that wealth increase.
actually people of color with advanced degrees, no matter what, holding everything else equal, no matter what, people of color with advanced degrees earn 20% less than white with advanced degrees. So we talk about one end of the continuum to the other end. Can I want to kind of come out of this conversation that it's only a poverty conversation? Yes. Working's report that just got released talked about the whole issue of the five dimensions in terms of if you're white and you're poor, it's, not, it's very different if you're black and Hispanic and you're poor because you're gonna be even poorer in terms of all those other factors. So we really gotta change what our dynamics are, what we look at in terms of research, in terms of data, and lift up what those challenges are. 60% of Americans still believe that most people can make it if they only are willing to work hard. 60% of us still believe that. But the challenge of how many grips with white skin privilege and how white privilege blinds you to the lack of access generally dictated by brown and black skin color. The limited to no birthright in relationship with friends and family, a white male driving in the middle of the night or driving at night in Baltimore City doesn't have to have his mother tell him, how should you behave when the police stop you? Where should your hands be? And how do you respond? They talked and he said, you know, I've never ever had the experience of being anywhere that I couldn't say what I wanted to say as a white male. He was floored to learn that his three very dynamic professional black women said, you know, there's certain places I can't say this, and there's certain places I can't say that, and there's certain, because I've got to adapt and adjust to your white world. So we want an economic opportunity, economic act, it is available to this city. The 3.3 billion is possible. Discouraging the separation, discrimination, and losing patience since the early 30s. Blacks and Jews shut out. The Fed knew about it. Red line mapped out, and so they kept us in the projects. No security, no maintenance. We kept the high rents. We gotta educate kids, make a better city, create something to be proud of. You feel me? It's far more ways out than in. Far more ways out than in. Now let me say it again. It's far more ways out than in. They raise the price based on the skin that I'm in. Check it. It's the lived consequences of decisions made 70, 80 years ago. So what we want to do is bring this home because Lord knows in Baltimore, in Detroit, in Gary, in D.C., this moment has given us the opportunity to have really serious conversations about race, about racism, about classism, about how it functions. But our game is not to talk. That's not just what we're here to do, to bring you here and have a four-part series of wonderful conversations. Our goal is to create the conditions where the ideas we're talking about can gain traction and the ideas can actually translate into new institutions, new interests that can then help Baltimore become more humane. I think one of the most important and the most salient uh, challenges we face has to do with this whole issue of, of the economy, of being a part of the economy, not having a sense of connection uh, to the equity uh, that is in the community. And finding ways to connect people uh, both to the, to the very idea of work as, an, as a central part of the equation. Uh, work, and not only to work for someone, but to own something to make something, to have a sense of value in a way that says we are, in fact, a, a part of this, uh, this, this equation. When we were kids, the majority of the city was not black. And when we were kids, the majority of the city was not poor or living on the edge of poverty. Now we live in a majority black city where the majority of people in the city within on the edge of poverty. Take all those numbers you hear like 25% and 30% and put them out the door. Because you, those are using definitions of poverty that were created under Lyndon Johnson's administration. They have no bearing on reality today of what it costs to live in the world in 2016. You have 77,000 people who are unemployed in the city. You have 91,000 families 91,000 families by our own housing department statistics that don't know that they can meet their bills every month. One of the problems is, is the conversation 
never gets beyond this in this city. The conversation and the planning and thinking about where we go doesn't go five blocks over this way. Doesn't go up to Liberty Heights and Garrison, even to the little class black world. And it sure enough does not go into the poor world that sits just a few blocks down here. So the people that are affected by the decisions are never inside the conversation, ever, ever. I mean, ever. And there are brilliant, thinking, caring people who know what they want their communities and what they want to see change and want to be part of that decision on how it changes. So if this conversation goes anywhere, it needs to go by bringing other people in, other people, think what I just said, other people, the other, into a conversation about where and how we build the future. How you unredline a city. How you open that red line. And how you make this a conversation for everybody. How you listen to them about what they want to do about the abandoned houses in their neighborhoods. What they want to do with the empty lots in their neighborhoods. What are their ideas about how to create jobs? What kind of jobs do they want to have? What do they want for their children? What kind of school system do they want? However, we do have a, a I think, a very interesting uh, crop of young uh, people and new voices uh, in the game. What is missing uh, is a set of influences and mandates from community about what we want them to do. Because what happens is too often we elect people and we leave it to them to decide what it is uh, they're going to do on our behalf. And so we end up with what we get. People turned out for this election. And I would have liked to have seen a lot more media coverage and a lot of celebration around the fact that we broke records in this city this year um, in terms of turnout. Um, more folks came out to vote than in 08 when Obama was up for That's huge. Can we give the community a round of applause, OK? I'm talking about being 10 years old, waking up in the morning going, shit, what am I going to get into today? And my mama waking up at 4.30 in the morning going, you know, just doing the do, and my daddy doing the do. And at the end of the day, who's got time to dig deep in these issues? We, my daddy read the paper, we looked at the news. But folks ain't got time to go deep. So when they go out to vote and they cast their vote for someone who was supposed to represent their interests and they made the time in, in, in their full lives to choose someone, that person needs to be of high integrity and they need to honor their word. It's not, you know, yes, community is speaking out now. But those of us who have the luxury of a little extra time, those of us who don't have to worry about the bills so much, we have to put in the time for them. We have to, and we have to talk, talk to them, with them, work with them. In all of these communities, there is at least, at least a handful of leaders that are walking those streets and are doing this work unpaid because they see themselves as a peacekeeper in the neighborhood, as the mother in the neighborhood, as the father figure in the neighborhood. Those are the people that we need to speak to and work with to find these solutions. You know, I've had a day, I've had eight months here, and I've had a lifetime of seeing how slow government moves. And I know that there's a 45-year-old man right there. And every generation, we talk about the kids, we talk about the kids, we talk about the kids. And people from the ages of 30 to 60, they're going to die in the same state that they're in. The Hopkins bubble. How many Hopkins students in the room? Hands? All y'all know, when I say Hopkins bubble, you know exactly what I mean. You mean what we're talking about is a bubble, a, 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 a kind of a, a social bubble that's drawn around Hopkins where students and their parents are told you stay in this bubble, you're safe, and if you go outside this bubble, you're unsafe. Reverse red line. Yeah, reverse red line, right? And, and I actually know, I have a sense, that's an institutional project. To dissolve, to, to dissolve that bubble requires not just conversations, but it requires institutional work. So, for, so one institutional, just one minor modification, for example, is to have Hopkins RAs not tell their kids anymore that there actually is this Hopkins bubble that they shouldn't cross the line for, right? When, when you've got the Hopkins folk who are giving potential parents tours 
like you give them a script that doesn't doesn't say, okay, well, wow, we're pretty safe here, but there is kind of sketchy. You don't go there. You know, what type of institutional work do we have to do to expand our concept of us, where the people in this neighborhood or in this room actually think of the people a block over as us, as opposed to them? And I think it begins with that. We are a silo-driven city. We stay in our spaces. Even within our space, we only know, we don't even know the people in our own space. And so part of what we've got to do is to open our minds to both the value and the work that is invested in extending ourselves beyond the comfort and the, and the routine of our lives. It is risky, but it is where we discover who we are and who others are. Be creative. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do the institutional building and the talking and all of that, but everybody can't, you gotta get in where you fit in. Just one thing, and thank you all for staying. I don't consider this the end, I consider this the beginning. Uh, I've had one thing, I've had, I've sat on a number of different panels, been in this position a number of times over the past year, and there's this one element I would like those of you who are involved in this stuff to actually stop. If I participate in another conversation where an institutional actor, be they a nonprofit person or a, or a corporate leader or an executive, imply that it's the people that are broken, I'm going to slip somebody's story. It's not the people. Let's stop working on the assumption that what we've got to do is fix the people. Redlining isn't a fix the people problem. Redlining is a fix the institution, fix the space problem. And the sooner we start adopting that dynamic, the better off we'll all be.